Welcome to the Tech Strong AI podcast. I'm Amanda Rosani, and with me today is Mike Bazard. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing well. We have a large lineup of articles to share with you today, so we're going to dive right in with this one is about the Gartner hype cycle. It's very interesting. I'm going to read a little bit from the article. The general public's enthusiasm with AI can be measured through the Gartner hype cycle, which is a chart that graphs the life cycle of innovation. This chart bears a strong resemblance to a roller coaster, and we are currently riding along the first and the tallest incline when it comes to AI. And then we have a couple other articles on Tech Strong AI that talk about how businesses are really trying to jump on and harness AI technology for a variety of different solutions. So what are your thoughts? Well, this may all come to a surprise to anybody who's outside of IT, but um, AI is challenging to implement. And the hype cycle has been out of control for some time now in the sense that, you know, it's been awesome to see what Microsoft has done and OpenAI and Google and all these other folks. Um, They spent an inordinate amount of time and money just training AI models and hiring people to you know, tell the AI model that this is a cat and that's a dog and it took forever. Um, And you can't just replicate that as a business overnight. Um, They don't have the skills. They don't have the expertise. They don't have the technology. The data is strewn all over the place. So um, it it may be a surprise to investors, I guess, or maybe it's a surprise to end users. But, you know, the average company isn't going to be able to harness all this stuff so easily and what we're seeing that play out now is you know this hype cycle thing gartner has been playing this you know hype cycle thing now for as long as i can remember um i think the hype cycle existed long before gartner discovered it but that's a whole other issue um the point being though that um investors who kind of uh made some assumptions and 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 all the folks who covered this stuff especially out of the financial media they never seem to talk to anybody in IT about what all this stuff is and how it works and what the implications are. And there was all this assumption that uh, this stuff would just magically exist and we would invoke it because, you know, Microsoft made it available through a easy to use interface. But, you know, go look at what they're letting you do. It's not going to change your world, right? I can write an email better now. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I can do some interesting workflow things here, and I can create a summary of a meeting known, and that's all great and fun too. But does it change the GDP equation? Hardly. And I think that um, we'll see a next wave of this, and probably the hype cycle will kick up again. And maybe this, in the case of AI, is going to be that roller coaster phenomenon where we go up and down, up and down, and up and down. The next big thing you're at, domain-specific language models, otherwise also known as small language models that are trained for specific tasks. Uh, And then those LLMs will be used to create agents that will perform those tasks. The agents will be AI agents, and they'll be trained to do something specific and helpful and useful. And then we humans will figure out how to orchestrate these agents to perform various tasks across a workflow. And it'll be more like, uh, you know, we'll be conductors of a symphony, as it were, with all these things that are going to come together. But I just don't see that happening, you know, pervasively this year and probably well into next. But, I mean, it will happen. But it's just, uh, as somebody once said to me when I first got into this business, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. Yeah, I think AI is, of course, it's a fantastic technology. It's exciting what it holds for the future. But I I do see that business leaders are placing a little bit too much faith in AI for too much. (laughs) Yeah, and I sometimes just wonder where all that comes from because business leaders haven't been investing in tech forever and day. And I'm a huge fan of tech, don't get me wrong. But it's not like tech has moved the productivity curve substantially over the last two decades and people are not that much more productive or companies are not uh, by any metric that people seem to be tracking. I mean, maybe AI will be different, but these changes are incremental 
And to the degree that most of them may make the employee more efficient, it doesn't always translate into more profit for the company if the employee is more efficient, just because uh, there may not be enough volume of work for that employee. There may also be other things that employee needs to do in their life besides work. Yeah, exactly. So then moving on, we're going to talk about some news from AWS. You can find this on TechStrong AI and TechStrong ITSM. That's our newest site. And we haven't talked about that one as much. So check that one out. But can you share some of the new tools that they've unveiled over at AWS? Yeah, they're up to something that's pretty clever all in all. So um, it just puts a spotlight, though, on what is the future of application development and, you know, I wish they had been a little more clear about what they were trying to describe when they had this event in New York. But basically, there's two types of applications now that can be built using uh, a natural language interface that's invoking some type of LLM. And the first is what they're calling personal apps, right? Which is, um, you know, what they're saying is you can put into a prompt, a couple of, or maybe one or two prompts, and uh, this new uh, app, Amazon service will create that app for you based on what it sees in the prompt. So you now have your own personal app, and they were pointing out that it would probably be quicker for you to create a personal app than to go find an app that did what you wanted it to do and then learn how to do it. And there's probably some truth in that. Um, the second thing that was pretty interesting, too, is they were also talking about giving IT teams that don't typically have a lot of programming expertise access to a little code tool that you would access through a natural language interface that would allow them to build applications. And you know, historically, those teams have tended to build apps using low code tools, using I don't know, everything from you know some sort of spreadsheet interface to a small database to Lotus Notes back in the day. Uh, and these apps were extensions of essentially an IT service management framework, and they were used to uh, automate a particular workflow. They weren't really designed to scale all that high. Sometimes they did, and a lot of times they weren't very pretty. But we're going to have more of these apps than ever. And that, on the face of it, sounds good. But on the other end of it, this could easily wind up being too much of a good thing. Uh, if everybody and his brothers build in applications and we have more applications built in the next two years than we have in the last decade, I don't think we're quite prepared to manage that onslaught. I don't think people are going to be able to absorb it. And so a lot of this stuff may just wind up uh, going nowhere. And it's not quite clear to me, like if I build my own personal app and you got your own personal app, how are our two apps going to like interact with each other and maybe do something? There's a lot of unanswered questions here. So I think, uh, yeah. One, the way we think about building software is fundamentally changing. Two is, I don't think we understand exactly what the implications of that are. Yes, and then it, it brings up the question, do we really need all these personalized apps? For certain, for certain things, yes. For other things, no, because as you said, the app sprawl is going to be tremendous. Yeah, and then what happens is like my phone, which is a mess. I have more apps that I've downloaded, installed, and used for about a hot minute and yeah, but I'm can't be bothered deleting them. And I'm sure that people who made them are thinking that I'm a, or hoping I might return as an active user someday. But I feel like, you know, if I can create an app on demand, I'll have an itch that I'm gonna scratch immediately and then I'm just gonna forget about it. Yes. So I guess we'll be hearing more about that and how they handle that moving forward. Next, we're going to talk about data. Of course, we're always talking about data on this show, and this is about data hoarding. So I'm going to read um, from this article. According to a recent study, all respondents who are adopting or plan to adopt Gen AI have encountered challenges, with 49% in the U.S. claiming the quality of data is at the top of the list. It's nearly impossible for businesses to use AI to gain actionable insights from outdated data. The bottom line, organizations must prioritize organizing and classifying their data from its creation and initial storage to when it becomes obsolete and in need of permanent removal. So what are your thoughts? Well, we've been talking about the fact that data management in most enterprises is a mess. And 
we've kind of allowed that to happen because each department created their own applications and then wound up describing simple things like company names that are customers differently in those applications. And they never really, we talked about, you know, cleaning all that up and data quality and centralizing that for years. The number of organizations that actually did it, not very high. And there's been, you know, some chief data officers appointed over the years and not quite clear to me how much progress they made. And then along came AI and everybody woke up one morning and said, my God, we got to like get some value out of this amazing AI stuff. The trouble is AI is only as good as the data that it's gets shown and still garbage in, garbage out. And there's just a massive amount of garbage in enterprise and IT environments. The, whether it's you know sitting in an SAP application that conflicts with a Salesforce application, it's just rampant. And I think you know going back to our earlier conversation about Gartner, we're just not having an honest conversation about where we are. Yeah, I think maybe it's a struggle too for them to determine what is outdated, unusable, unusable data versus the data that they should keep. Maybe they're just afraid, as we see, there's this issue with data hoarding. They're afraid to let go of the data. Yeah, and again, why everybody's kind of terrified, because they don't know what data might be valuable someday, and they think that the algorithms maybe someday will uh, uncover some massive truth that um, a data science team is able to uncover because they were able to compare 22 years worth of data. I don't know. I think that maybe um, the the more recent the data is, the more valuable it is, and just start cleaning up, say, I don't know, randomly pick the last six months worth of data. Just clean up from there. And then over time, if you want to get ambitious, great. But um, I don't think we can afford to um, clean up this entire mess that we've been making for three decades in three weeks. Yeah, it's going to take a little bit longer, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next, AI government governance. Uh, this comes from TechStrong AI. It says, when it comes to implementation and governance of AI, there is a three-step starter program recommended, which is leveraging existing data classifications, inventory proposed AI use cases, and then implement the low-risk, high-reward efforts. And this is a helpful article on, you know, how to implement and then establish that governance. So what are the the struggles business leaders are facing when it comes to this? A lot of this will go back to uh, audits. And ultimately, I need to show some providence of the data that I use to train the AI model. So when the outcome goes wonky, I can at least show that I had some responsible behavior. Um Hopefully, you know, this three-step program will prevent you from signing up from the AI 12-step program because you have to stand there and explain to people, I got a little addicted to AI, and the next thing you know, I applied it to everything without any thought process as to what the outputs would be. So it really is about maturity, and it comes down to uh, the security of the data, the provenance, usage, uh, who's allowed to see what data when. Some data is more sensitive than others. And so not everybody needs to see um, a social security number if you're using that within the context of some RAG solution. You got to really think through who's allowed to see what and what impact that has on how the LL works. There's just a lot of nuance here around the governance side of this that, um, you know, if you think we're not doing much in the way of managing data, well, then what makes you think we're doing anything to govern it? Yes. And of course, we always talk about communication and it's going to require good communication between all involved as well. Yeah. I and mean, I, I, it's going to require an investment in some new tools to go do that. And again, it adds to the total cost of the thing. And part of the issue is, well, companies don't have unlimited budgets. They would love to be able to tell everybody, go play with AI, but then I wind up with a million proof of concepts. Well, that's interesting, maybe, but eventually, only two or three of those things probably are going to get the budget to go forward. So you need to start sorting that out now. Mm -hmm. Okay, last but not least, this is a very important topic, actually, and this is how AI is affecting our children. So I'm going to read the this article Children of all ages are gaining access to AI tools with many requiring little to no form of parental consent. 
Even though there are many profound benefits to the wide variety of tools available, if we aren't aware of the many risks of these AI chatbots on children, we face immense risks involving data privacy loss, cyber threats, and inappropriate content. Content. So yes, this is a serious concern how AI is affecting our children. And what are your thoughts? I don't know what to do about it. I know it exists and I know that it's probably only a matter of time before, you know, a lot of the kids, they like to be on these discord servers with their buddies and chat about certain, you know, topics that they're all interested in, or at least they know it's a, it's a small group, but yeah, you know, then one of them starts interacting with a chatbot and starts asking you questions and they all giggle at the answer. And the next thing you know, the chatbot's part of the conversation flow. And this will play out time and time again across every one of these websites. In fact, uh, there's some stories floating around out there on the journal today talking about how um, X tried to use Grok to summarize headlines as it related to uh, the assassination attempt on former President Trump. Um, you know, and the headlines generated were a mess. They were kind of all over the place, pulled from everything. A couple said, you know, Kamala Harris had been shot at. Others said, uh, you know, uh, the shooter was, you know, some sort of, you know, democratically inspired assailant. Um and this stuff's all not helpful. And it's, you know, it's it's accidental disinformation at the end of the day, but it gets into the systems and, they, and it's not clear to me that kids, you know, are in a position to understand how to process that or understand what's real and what's not real. And, and then they internalize it. And, you know, all kinds of things start to happen. I'm, I'm generally fairly liberal in my outlook in terms of how folks should consume information, but some level of um, supervision is going to be required here. And, I'm, you know, we basically have built up AI on the same frameworks that we're building social media on, and we're not doing a good job of um, managing access to social media based on age. So I got a bad feeling about all this right now, and I, but maybe somebody's got a better idea. Yeah, I do too. I mean, we know that children are on technology at a very early age now, and they are learning and absorbing everything really fast at, you know, as they're, you know, younger age. And so if they're believing what they're reading from AI and it's false information, yes, this is a problem. And and then you get the older students using it for writing reports and things like that and taking it at face value as correct information for their reports. They're not even learning at all because they're just giving it to to chat GPT to do or something. So it, there, well, there definitely needs to be a little bit of um, control there, I think. There will always be lazy students, and there are hopefully some students who find it difficult to articulate their ideas that maybe are getting some help from these things. So it can mm-hmm. cut both ways a little ways. But the, uh, the combination of AI and social media is a little dangerous just because the social media platforms are using algorithms to kind of drive people to click on the next thing. And the AI is sitting there trying to come up with or guess what is that next thing that they might click on. It creates a little bit of a vicious cycle in terms of, you know, if I'm programming these things for an outcome that says more clicks, then I'm just going to keep showing increasingly incredulous things to drive the clicks, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, all the the cyber threats stealing um, important information. So definitely some things to consider there. So, you know, just to be vigilant in that area and maybe pay attention to what these children are using on their different screens. Experimenting on people is bad. Experimenting on children is unconscionable. I agree. Well, that brings us to the end of our segment today. Let us know your thoughts about any of these articles. And again, go check out TechStrong ITSM. We don't bring up that one very much here. So check it out and let us know your thoughts. Have a great week. And do you have any last words, Mike? As always, folks, lean in. If you don't know what it is, you can't control it. We'll see you next time.